may I have your permission to begin the program? Thank you. We will begin today's program with a short prayer video.
I request the Honorable Vice Chancellor of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata, <coughs> Reverend Father Dr. John Felix Raj, and our special guest, Mr. P. Chidambaram, to kindly take their seats on the stage. Chancellor of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata, Reverend Father Dr. James Arjun Tete, Honorable Vice Chancellor of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata, Reverend Father Dr. John Felix Raj, Special Guest, Mr. P. Chidambaram, Respected Registrar, Professor Ashish Mitra, Professor Prabhat Kumar Dutta, Fathers and Sisters, Distinguished Guests, Faculty Members, and Staff. We have gathered here today for a special lecture by Mr. P. Chidambaram, Honorable Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha, and former Union Minister of Finance. Mr. Chidambaram will be deliberating on a subject pertinent to the occasion and of the greatest relevance in the present socio-political climate of our country, the future of democracy. We welcome you to St. Xavier's University, sir. I request the Honorable Vice-Chancellor of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata, Reverend Father Dr. John Felix Raj, to kindly felicitate our guest with an uttaryo, flower bouquet, and plaque. Vice Chancellor to kindly deliver the welcome address. Sri P. Chidambaram, Your Honorable Chancellor, Reverend Father Arjun Tete. Ministers, Justices, Faculty Members, Deans, Fathers, Sisters, Support Staff, and my dear friend Professor Prabha Tatto, who is the co-author of the book, and my dear friends. I extend a warm welcome to all of you to St. Xavier's University, Kolkata, and to this program of special lecture by Mr. Palaniyapan Chidambaram on a relevant theme, the future of democracy in India, which will be followed by the book launch. It is my pleasant duty this evening to extend a very warm welcome to Mr. Chidambaram, former finance minister, former home minister, honorable member of the parliament, Rajya Sabha, on your behalf, on behalf of St. Xavier's University. Today is an important day for all of us. 
Mr. Chitapuram's presence this evening has blessed us and his lecture will definitely boost our academic search in understanding democracy and its various intricacies. I remember Mr. Chitapuram's visit to St. Xavier's College in 2010. That was the occasion of Sesqui Centenary Celebration. We were celebrating the 150th anniversary of the foundation of St. Xavier's College. As many of us know, he is a Jesuit alumnus, studied in Loyola College, Chennai, and he was a member of Parliament of my own home constituency, Sivagangai, and now it is his son who has taken over that place from him. I want to, of course, thank him very specially for accepting our invitation and being here exclusively for us. His presence, his address, and his interaction with us on such an interesting theme will go on record and will enrich us. I'm very grateful to you, sir, for generously accepting to release our book. When I spoke to him, the first question he asked me was, what was the book about? And I said, it is on development, decentralization and democracy. And there was no further question. He said, accept it. And we decided upon the theme, the future of democracy in India. This book, Development, Decentralization and Democracy, authored by Professor Prabhat Dattu and myself, is dedicated to none other than Reverend Father Albert Hewat, a veteran educationist who spent more than 50 years in West Bengal and in India, especially in the city of Joy, Kolkata. He spent many years in St. Xavier's College, almost 32 years as a professor, as vice principal and rector. And he was my own mentor. Professor Prabhat Tattu and myself take pride in dedicating this book to this great soul. For the Huat, in the launch of the book by Mr. Chidambaram, we are privileged that you are with us this evening. Mr. Chidambaram, of course, arrived to this campus in the morning and spent some time with the Jesuits and then went around the campus and I'm told that he spent a lot of time in the library, especially in the law library and the moot court. We are privileged, sir, and your presence is a blessing to us. We thank you on behalf of St. Xavier's University, the staff, the faculty members, the Jesuit fathers, the sisters, the Zavarians, and the Alumni Association. This invitation of ours will go on record and definitely your lecture and your presence with us will also go on the record. Once again, I extend to all of you, especially to Mr. Chidambaram, a warm welcome to St. Xavier's University. Thank you very much and God bless you. Mr. Chidambaram, an eminent legal advocate, economist, former Union Minister of Finance, and Honorable Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha. Mr. Chidambaram completed his higher education in Madras, earning a bachelor's degree in statistics and law 
from Presidency College and Madras Law College, respectively. As a student of Loyola College, Chennai, he is also a Jesuit alumnus. Thereafter, Mr. Chidambaram earned a master's degree in business administration from Harvard University, Massachusetts. Mr. Chidambaram's long and illustrious career as a parliamentarian and political leader cannot be adequately summarized. He has served as the Union Minister of Finance four times between 2004 and 2014. In 2008, he was appointed as the Union Home Minister and served this office for three and a half years. As Union Minister of Finance, Mr. Chidambaram has been instrumental in initiating a tax reform program to deal with the unwieldy fiscal deficit in 1996-1997. His 2008 budget was widely acknowledged for its success in securing double-digit economic growth and rise in the government spending in rural sectors. Mr. Chidambaram's deep understanding of the problems underlying the Indian economy and the ways of solving them have been instrumental in his role as a political visionary. His dynamic leadership and incisive judgments on issues such as agriculture, reforms, budget, economic growth and tax policies have had a monumental impact in the shaping of our democracy. We look forward to his talk on the future of democracy in India. I now invite Sir to kindly deliver his lecture. to all of you. His Grace, Most Reverend Thomas de Souza, Archbishop of Calcutta, Honorable Chancellor of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata, Reverend Father Dr. James Arjun Tete, <coughs> Vice Chancellor Reverend Father Dr. John Felix Raj, <coughs> Registrar Professor Ashish Mitra, Professor Prabhat Kumar Dato, co author of the book, Fathers, Sisters, Distinguished Guests, Faculty, Special Invitees and my dear students. Democracy has many meanings. And if Abraham Lincoln was alive today, he would be called old-fashioned and outdated. Hundred and sixty years ago to this month, Lincoln said, democracy is government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Today, if he was alive, he would take back those words and apologize for saying it's government of the people and government by the people and government for the people. We always associate democracy with the Westminster model. The Westminster model is over 800 years old. Even today, the British House of Commons is housed in the Palace of Westminster, which is in Westminster Borough. And that's why it's called Westminster Model. But not all democratic countries follow that model. There are different models 
all of them retaining the essential characteristics of democracy. There is a presidential model of the United States. There is a president come prime ministerial model of France. There is multi-party democracy and coalition governments in Europe. There is a model in Australia where the speaker is not impartial. The speaker is a partisan speaker. There are different models in other countries. Even one party countries claim to be one party democracies. Lifetime presidents claim to be elected every time, every five years. There are some countries where they hold elections by putting all the opposition leaders in prison. There are countries which hold elections where only one party is entitled to nominate candidates. All of them claim to be democracy. Which is why I agree with Prime Minister Sheikh Hazina, who has her own model of democracy, when she said that, and that's quoted in the Time magazine last week, democracy means varied things in varied countries. We have our own model of democracy. The constitution makers thought they were following the Westminster model and it will remain intact. They copied the House of Commons, a modified version of the House of Lords, the cabinet system, the Prime Minister as the linchpin of the cabinet system, an executive accountable every day, every hour, every minute to Parliament or the legislature in the states, an independent judiciary, and a free press. They thought they made provisions of the Constitution which will ensure these basic features. Of course, it took us many, many years to discover that these basic features had been eroded and almost forgotten. And that's why in Kesho and Bharati, the Supreme Court had to remind itself and remind the people that the basic structure of India was unalterable forever. Nevertheless, there are voices which speak a different language. I'm conscious that I'm addressing an audience in an academic institution and that run by Jesuits and Jesuits preach the Christian faith. I should be very careful not to utter any words that may sound political or partisan. But the fundamental message has to be conveyed. And the fundamental message that I wish to convey today is that over the years, democracy has been hollowed out in this country. The superstructure is intact. The facade is appealing, but inside it's practically hollowed out. 
and I should try to explain as best as I can why I think it's hollowed out. The fundamental principle of democracy is that the rulers must be elected from time to time. It can be three years, as in Australia and New Zealand, four years, as in the United States, five years, as in India, unpredictable, as in many European countries, but still, every time, they must be elected before they assume office. Elections in this country are based on the principle of one person, one vote. But let's not delude ourselves. For many, many years, although it was one person, one vote, in practical terms, large numbers of the people of India were effectively disenfranchised. They could not register as voters. They could not afford to travel to distant polling stations. And when they did, they did not find their names on the electoral rolls. And even if they found their names on the electoral rolls, they were prevented from voting. This was especially so for the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes. Nevertheless, over the years, the election machinery improved and strengthened and it more or less became a rule that one person, one vote will elect the representative of that constituency. There was a time when a mere 5,000 rupees or a couple of decades later, a mere 50,000 rupees was enough to elect a member of the Legislative Assembly. Today, 1,760 crore of unaccounted money has been seized in the ongoing elections in five states, and one of them is not yet over. The fourth was voting today. 1,760 crore of unaccounted money intended to be used in the elections has been seized just this year in this month. Money is the most determined determinant factor in an election today. My first election, we printed a few handbills, a few thousand posters, and the candidate went round in a car or a van, and in my case, a truck, village to village, simply appealing to the voters to vote. Today, all that is history. Today, money and vast amounts of money being distributed during the elections, on the election day, is a determinant factor. A rally today is a glitzy show. Hundreds of trucks bring people over the promise of food, drink, money. There's song and dance and documentaries and television screen uh, screenings. And a rally will cost today upward of one crore of rupees. On election day, money is distributed. <coughs> Voters are completely non-discriminatory. They take money from 
every party which is willing to offer them money. It was said of Sir Francis Bacon, he was a judge, he took money from both sides but decided fairly. <laughs> the ultimate result in a constituency may be democratic, but the process is anything but democratic. And when the process gets corrupted, eventually the ultimate result will be corrupt. The second reason for hollowing out democracy is the play of religion. We just saw a beautiful documentary on the commonness of faith and prayer among all religions. But that's no longer true. Religion ought to have no place in an election. You're voting as a citizen, not voting as one belonging to a particular faith. But today, religion is omnipresent in an election. In fact, when reminded of the basic structure of this country, a member of parliament from Madhya Pradesh said, the basic structure of this country is Akhanda Bharat Hindu Rashtra before 1192. I've still not been able to find out the relevance of 1192. Now, religion is so present in an election. Religion seems to be next only to money the determining factor in an election. There is a political party which has consistently refused to nominate any candidate other than a Hindu in state after state after state. Although in some states the proportion of the Muslim population is as high as 20% or 14% or 10%, the party has refused to nominate a single candidate from the Muslim community in election after election after election. The third reason why the democracy is being hollowed out is we are undermining, debilitating, and virtually rendering ineffective, the institutions would support democracy. We all think as long as there is a parliament, there is a government and there is a judiciary and there is a media, democracy is intact. Those undoubtedly are the four pillars of democracy, but they are, they require number of institutions to support the superstructure. Now, each one of these institutions and even the basic pillars are being eroded. For example, we are moving towards centralism. I look forward to reading the book on development, decentralization of democracy, but we are moving towards centralism which is the antithesis of democracy. Democracy means you derive power from the people, but return power to the people to administer themselves. Now, in my view, the Uniform Civil Code is anti-democratic. It will be majoritarian driven, whether you like it or not. The National Register of Citizens is again a drive towards centralism and anti-democratic. The new education policy is another drive towards centralism, robbing states of the right to administer education, which is a concurrent subject. Today, many of you may not know, the appointment of vice-chancellors of universities 
including state-funded, state-run universities. The appointment of the Director General of Police of a state requires central approval of one agency or other of the central government. Parliament makes many, many laws on concurrent subjects, virtually robbing the state of legislative power. Because if the state makes any law on a concurrent subject on which there is a parliamentary law, immediately that law is ineffective unless it has the approval of the president. More parliamentary laws on concurrent subjects effectively deprive the state of making its own laws. Criminal laws are in the concurrent list, but increasingly parliament makes criminal laws. Not only does parliament make criminal laws, parliament has made agencies, a number of agencies, which enter states in the pretext of investigating a crime, a new crime under the new law, and virtually takes over the administration of criminal law from the state government. Police and law and order are essentially state subjects, but increasingly you find that central police, central police agencies dominate and take over any investigation they wish to take over. Electoral bonds is another way of centralizing power. If the only way citizens can contribute to a political party is electoral bond, the electoral bonds subject is sub judice, so I should be careful. Electoral bond is the way of ensuring who contributes to whom and keeping a vigilant eye over who contributes to whom and who ought not to contribute to anyone else. Centralization, centralism, I call it centralism, is anti-democratic. Then there is the famous oneness project. I call it the oneness project. One nation, one ration card. One nation, one election. One nation, one language. One nation, one culture, one dress, one food habit. One nation, one moral code. One nation, one family code. All these oneness projects are completely anti-democratic. For example, what is the result of one nation, one ration card? Prime Minister Xi might appear to be a good idea, but the fact is there are 45 million people who are migrants within the country. 45 million people are internal migrants they go from state to state in search of work. It so happens that many of them are from the poorer North Indian states. They migrate to the Western Indian states or the South Indian states. Of the 45 million migrants, 54 are interstate migrants. They don't migrate from one place in the state to another place in the state. They actually move from one state to another. Technically, under the one ration card scheme, his ration card issued in Bihar must be able to get rations in, say, Tamil Nadu. But he does not. Of the 54, five, of the 54 million interstate migrants, only 1.4 million, that is 14 lakhs, get rations on the ration card issued by another state. 
The others are completely deprived of the rations under the so-called one nation, one ration card scheme. Take for example, the other point I mentioned, one nation, one election. A one nation, one election deprives the people of a state through their representatives to unseat an unpopular government midterm and exercise their right to elect a new government. That is fundamental in a representative democracy. The right to vote also includes the right to unseat a government. But one nation, one election will mean that unpopular governments, unrepresentative governments, will continue for five years until the nation is, gets ready for one election. I could multiply examples. For example, one nation, one language. Now the bitter truth is, the bitter truth is, the one language, two languages, or three languages controversy, which is raging throughout the country, and it raises its head from time to time. It is really one language for the Hindi-speaking states. It is two languages for Hindi-knowing states. And it's only three languages for non-Hindi states. I'll explain briefly. In most Hindi-speaking states, although technically English is required, there are no English classes because there are no English teachers. Mm -hmm. And none of those children can speak a word of English. An eighth standard student in this country, if you give him or her a second standard text in English, the eighth standard student cannot read five English words of a second standard text. That's so also for mathematics and it's so for other subjects. Hindi knowing states, Hindi leaning states like Maharashtra, Gujarat, Punjab, which are languages similar to Hindi, they opt for Hindi as a second language apart from Marathi or Gujarati or Punjabi as a first language. So they have two languages. It is only the southern states which don't trace their languages to Sanskrit. The three language formula is sought to be implemented and obviously there is resistance to the three language formula. So the one nation, one language is not implemented on the ground because it cannot be implemented. Nobody will accept that one language should dominate over all <coughs> other languages or prevail over all other cultures built around the language. Every sociologist and student of history knows that a culture develops around the language. Language is the most powerful glue of a society or a community and all that builds up as a culture is around the language. It's literature, it's poetry, it's dance, it's drama. Uh, all builds around the language and nobody will accept that his or her language should be dominated by another language. Secularism is so discredited today, it has got another name. If you want to accuse somebody of secularism, you call that appeasement. It's a code language, it's a code word for discrediting secularism. The result is what? 78.4% of India is Hindu, 14.4% of India is Muslim, 2.2% of India is Christian, 1.7% of India is Sikh, and the other faiths constitute 3.5%. Contrary to popular perception, these ratios are not changing. Why? Because birth rates are converging. They have practically converged and there will be complete conversion, <coughs> convergence in about five or six years. 
And until India's population stabilizes at 165 crore or 170 crore, this is the population ratios which will remain intact for the next 40 years or so. So nothing is happening to the religious composition of India. Yet today, if you're a non-Hindu, and pardon me for being blunt, if you're a non-Hindu, you feel today you're a half a citizen. And if you're a Muslim, you will feel that you're a non-citizen. That is because secularism is being systematically discredited in this country. The other way of following out democracy is to unseat governments through dubious means. This has happened in, in the last few years in several states. I need hardly list the states, but engineering defections from one party to another and causing the collapse of an elected government and the assumption of office of another government is another way to hollow out democracy. And that's happening once too often. The last state that happened was Goa. The state that is waiting to happen, I don't know. Because any state, it may happen. Engineering defections and changing governments, not going back to the people for a mandate, but engineering defections and changing government is a way of hollowing out democracy. The next way of hollowing out democracy is to assert racial supremacy or cultural supremacy. An important political leader and a social leader said, we must have all Indians belong or must be brought under the Aryan culture. And I don't know what that means. But he also said that you must aggressively combat love jihad and conversion. You study in a Christian run institution. I studied all my life in a Christian run institution from kindergarten, which we used to call in Chennai, baby class. Kindergarten to post-graduation, I studied in Christian institutions. I asked, how many of you have been converted or attempted to be converted? In school, run, run by Scottish missionaries, we were offered a choice of attending Bible classes or moral science classes. The vast majority of that Christian run school was Hindu, obviously. Over 85% of the students were Hindus. And there would be a smattering of Muslims and a significant minority of Christians. But the choice was offered of Bible or moral classes. And the Bible classes were taken by the legendary headmaster, Mr. Kurvilla Jacob. The overwhelming majority of the class, something like 95% of the class, will opt for Bible classes rather than moral science classes. Nobody attempted to convert me. Has anyone attempted to convert you? How many cases of conversion are there? And how many cases of Hindu girls being abducted by Muslim or Christian boys have you come across in life? Has it happened in your village? Has it happened in your neighborhood? All this is in the name of one culture, that we all belong to one race or one culture. This is hollowing out of democracy. Finally, remember what Bill Kisbaru said. The young mother who was pregnant, who was attacked, and 12 of her relatives were killed, 
when her attackers who had been convicted were freed from prison, she had to disappear for her own safety. And all that she told the Supreme Court was, give me back my right to live without fear. If a citizen of India has to appeal to the Supreme Court, give me back my right to live without fear, ask yourself, how many people in this country live without fear? I know that journalists live in fear, bankers live in fear, media houses live in fear, government servants live in fear, especially officers at the top level, members of parliament live in fear, ministers live in fear, business persons live in fear. In fact, you can count on the finger of one hand the sections of people who live without fear. Living in fear is the antithesis of democracy. You must be, live, must be able to live without fear. And India, for all these reasons, has been described as an electoral autocracy. The Vden Institute of Sweden described India as an electoral autocracy. We elect, but we don't elect a democratic government. We think we elect a democratic government, but we're actually electing an autocratic government. On the and as a result of the way we practice and implement democracy, have we grown, have we developed? Again, look forward to the book on development. Have we grown? Have we developed? I'll give you two sets of statistics and close my lecture. Between 2014 and 2022, in an eight year period, on the Human Capital Index, we have slid from rank 100 to 116. On the Human Capital Index. On the Global Hunger Index, which is so widely known today among academics, we are today 107 out of 111 countries. On Human Freedom Index, we have slid from 106 eight years ago to 150. On the Environmental Protection Index, we have slid from 155 to 180. On the Gender Equality Index, we have slid from 114 to 135. On the Human Development Index, we are more or less stationary from 130 to 132. On the Press Freedom Index, we have slid from 140 to 150. These are non-economic metrics. On the non-economic metrics, we have slid. The way we practice democracy has not made us a more developed country. A country where human freedoms, gender equality has promoted or hunger has been staved off. Let's look at one economic parameter. We all know that among the G20 countries, we are the 20th, among the G20 countries, we are the 20th in per capita income and in every other metric. In every other metric, we are the last among the G20 countries. The G20 countries are 
a club of rich and powerful countries. We are powerful, but not rich. But forget the G20 countries. Look at our own standards. Look at our own material progress. I'll close with this very telling statistic. This is official statistics reported in the PLFS Periodic Labor Survey. In 2017-18 to 2022-23, a period of 17-18, 18-19, 19-20, 20-21, 21-22, 21, 22, and 22, 23, six years. There are three categories of people in this country who are working. One is self-employed, one is casual daily labor, and one is regular job holders. Broadly, every working person will fall under these three categories. In these six years, we all know that inflation has been averaging about 6%. But even taking inflation at 4%, in the six years, inflation has eroded your money by at least 24%. I'm taking the very minimum as a comparator. Six years ago, the self-employed had a monthly income, average monthly income, of 12,318 rupees. Today, it is 13,347 rupees. Discounted for inflation, it is actually negative. The casual daily laborer had an average annual income of 6,969 rupees. Today, it is 7,899 rupees. Applying the inflation, it is hopelessly negative. The regular job holder had an average monthly income of 19,450 rupees. Six years later, it is 20,039 rupees an increase of about 600 rupees. Applying the inflation, it is hopelessly negative. So the average Indian has not become richer. The average Indian's quality of life has not improved. The standard of living has not improved. There are more public goods and services, which I do not deny. But in terms of private personal income, individual income, he or his family are not better off. And this is also reflected in the National Family Health Survey, where you find that over 50% of women are undernourished. A large proportion of children are either malnourished or stunted or wasted. COVID has only added to the miseries. But these miseries are because we have not yet understood what true democracy means. True democracy is like a high tide. It must lift all boats. But our democracy does not lift all boats. The bottom 50% of India has 3% of the national assets or wealth and has 10% of the national income. If over 70 crore people have to share 10% of the total income of this country, you can imagine why the democracy, the way we practice democracy, does not lift all boats. I agree, no boat has actually sunk but that's no comfort, that's no consolation. That no boat has actually capsized this, no consolation. What it means is many boats are leaking, they are not rising with the development of the country. We have to 
rediscover democracy. Before, and I caution you, before anybody revisits our constitution and revises the constitution and rewrites the constitution to reflect a particular biased view of what India should be or ought to be. Before any section revisits the constitution, let us rediscover the meaning of true democracy. Thank you for this opportunity. of democracy. We are truly inspired by your words. We open the house for a few questions from the audience. I request the audience to kindly write their question on the paper provided and pass it forward to the volunteers. The audience is further requested to kindly keep their questions brief and pertinent to the lecture. I request the Honorable Vice-Chancellor of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata, Reverend Father Dr. John Felix Raj, to kindly come on stage and moderate the interactive session. Just raise your hand, but keep your questions very short and to the point. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Shubhani Chaudhuri, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Economics. Sir, I request you to kindly go forward and ask your question to sir. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it was a fascinating lecture, uh, Mr. Chidambaram, and we have all enriched by your comments about the future of democracy in India. And you have listed a number of issues which have borrowed out democracy. My question is that isn't economic inequality and chronic capitalism also responsible for borrowing out uh, democracy in India? Absolutely. Growing economic inequalities is one of the reasons why uh, we are borrowing out democracy. I gave you one metric. The bottom 50% owns 3% of the nation's assets and enjoys 10% of the nation's income. I didn't tell you what the top 1% or the top 10% does. If I had given you those numbers, uh, most people will feel so diminished and so uh, bitter. The top Five, three to five percent enjoys almost uh, the top ten percent enjoys about seventy percent of the nation's wealth, and among them, among the wealthy, there is clearly today a bias in favour of my businessman versus your businessman. The system is working in a manner that we are creating duopolies which will eventually become a monopoly. There is that great danger. The Competition Commission was virtually emasculated until a few months ago by no appointments. And the manner in which the Competition Commission functions today is not to prevent or break monopolies, but actually to encourage duopolies and monopolies. This is an area where I am very, very concerned, and uh, it must be certainly inquired into very seriously. The second question we have received 
received is from Dr. Shomnath Banerjee, Associate Professor of Commerce and Management. Sir, uh, sir, on one hand, uh, what we come to hear from the media that it is being uh, the fifth largest economy, it is growing at this rate, which is ever increasing. And on the other hand, we are really moved by this information that 70% of the income is being shared, I mean, 10% of the income is being shared by the 70% of the citizens. So apart from democracy, what are the other factors which are creating this huge disparity? I mean, on one hand, uh, the reports are that economy is growing faster and faster. On the other hand, what is happening to the people who are marginalized, who are uh, who belongs to the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes and the rural people. What are the other factors apart from democracy, which is, I mean, actually the root of this problem? I will answer the second question, but on the first comment that we are the fifth largest economy, it's an arithmetical inevitability. If 140 crore people continue to plow their fields, continue to run their business firms, continue to run factories, continue to grow vegetables, paddy, wheat, millets, continue to make shoes, clothes. An economy will produce unless everybody decides to fold his hands and to be idle. An economy will produce. And with 140 crore people, even if they produce small amounts of money, it is an arithmetical inevitability that you will go from 10 to 9 to 9 to 8, 8 to 7 and 5 and we will become 3 and we will become 2. Nobody in India is willing to say we will become 1. <laughs> Why? The two largest populated countries will become one and two unless somebody from another planet descends upon us and say what fools you are, we are ahead of you by 200 years. So there is nothing great about becoming the fifth largest economy in the world. Apart from What are the other reasons why economic inequality is growing? The biggest reason is unemployment. You see, there are two factors when you, most students of economics will know. The first is the labor participation rate of all those who are between, say, 15 years and 59 years, who are considered able-bodied workers, what is the labor participation rate? How much of them participates in the labor market? In some countries, it's as high as 60 or 70 percent. Everybody works. In India, the labor participation rate has never exceeded 50%. It's around 42%. The remaining 58% don't enter the labor market. Of the 42% who enter the labor market, the unemployment rate is 8.1%, 7% to 8%. Among 15 to 24 years, unemployment rate is 23 percent. I'm not trying to frighten anyone in the graduating class. Among age group 15 to 24, the unemployment rate is 23 percent. Among all graduates, the unemployment rate is 
If so many people are unemployed, obviously inequalities will widen. There are one in there are 1.4 crore families in this country who has nobody with a, in the family with a job. There's no job at all. In a high per capita income state like Goa, every other house, every other house has an unemployed, unemployed graduate girl or boy. The biggest reason why inequalities are widening is because of unemployment. There are many other reasons. One is the large sections of the people are simply unable to access capital. Capitalist flows only to a very small section of people. Large sections cannot access capital. <coughs> In fact, large sections cannot access a bank loan. <coughs> Therefore, while the COVID hit big industries, some have collapsed. Many of them got rehabilitated. The vast, a vast proportion of the MSMEs have simply shut shop. MSMEs are the ones that provide jobs. A large number of MSMEs have simply shut shop because of lack of access to capital. I mean, I could list a few more reasons, but I think it's a sufficient now. Unemployment is one major reason for the growing inequality. Lack of access to capital is another reason for the growing inequality. The third question is from Dr. Asif Iqbal, an assistant professor of Xavier Law School. Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you, first of all, for such an illuminating session on a relevant topic for the day. Uh, so my question to you is like, uh, as a student of law, I'm very curious to know, like the present uh, collegium system, uh, do you think that this uh, collegium system is a success for upholding the principles of this independence of judiciary or should we proceed to some other like alternatives like the judicial appointments commission for mm -hmm. our uh, federal democracy Winston Churchill said democracy is the worst form of government except that it is better than anyone else no, I agree. Pre collegium days, we appointed outstanding judges. Some bad apples also found a way to the bench. Post collegium days, also we appoint outstanding judges, but even now bad apples go to the bench. So I don't think there is any great difference between pre-collegium and post-collegium. The collegium has not made a marked improvement in the system. In fact, the collegium is seen as a threat by the executive government. And earlier, if the executive government took three months to appoint a new judge, new judge in a vacancy, the collegium system has made it only worse because it's seen as a threat, a rival to the executive government. Be that as it may. So I don't think collegium is responsible for good or the bad system. Irrespective of the collegium system, I think the outcome remains the same. But your second part of the question is the more interesting question. Is there an alternative to the collegium system? And what would an alternative do today? What is the impact of an alternative to today? The impact of an alternative to the collegium will mean we go back to the text of the constitutional provision, 
the president shall appoint, which means the government shall appoint. Imagine in the state of democracy that we have, if the government alone had the exclusive right to appoint judges, what kind of havoc will happen in this country? Therefore, while the collegium has not improved the system, I think the collegium is a bulwark against rapid rapid decline of the system. At least the collegium is able to stop the excesses of the government. The question from, from students. Can we have some questions from our students? Yes, that's a professor from Sibiri. Yes, Panchali. I think she qualifies as a student also because the professor is also always a student. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. Firstly, thank you very much for your uh, lucid and structured lecture. As uh, students still, we learned a lot from you, from your, all your clarifications. Uh, I would like to share and in that uh, sense put a question to you. You refer to the VDEM report. Uh, I was just reading the other day uh, to discuss it with students in class, the last 2023 report which talks about black, uh, backsliding of democracy all over the world, including India, the largest democracy, and USA, the oldest democracy. It's uh, a sorry state of affairs, we all know, in our country at the moment. So if you could suggest some ways out which you think would help the citizens of the country, the civil society at large. Thank you, sir. You see, the antidote to the backsliding of democracy is for people to live without fear and vote without fear or favor. Well, that's easier said than done. People live in fear. I can give you any number of examples. I encountered a banker one day on a flight, and we were chit-chatting, and I asked him, are you getting big ticket loan applications, and are you sanctioning loan applications? Big ticket. I'm not talking about housing loan and uh, two-wheeler loan. That's what we call lazy banking. You don't have to be a banker. <laughs> if a house or a two-wheeler or a car is being given a security, <laughs> even a machine can grant the loan. So are you looking at big ticket loans? He looked around and came to me and whispered in my ear, Sir, I'm retiring in six months. <laughs> Now, why would he give a big ticket loan? Fifteen years later, somebody will knock on his door and say, the loan you gave to so-and-so has failed. That company is not prospered. Therefore, I am the CBI. I am coming to inquire you. Forgetting that banking is a business like anyone else. In business, there will be successes and failures. Some portion of the loan will become bad. Some loan accounts will fail. Now if a banker at the top of the bank, the chairman and managing director, lives in fear, officers live in fear, journalists live in fear. I was dining with a journalist one day. It was a winter day. And then he got a call. It was a Saturday or a Sunday. He got a call saying, go back to your house. There is an OB van outside the house. The van assistant is carrying a script. I want you to read it into the television camera. We have to broadcast it immediately. He immediately said, I have to wind up my dinner and leave. I said, why? It's a winter day, it's already 10 o'clock at night. It's a Saturday or a Sunday, why do you have to go? Why don't you tell your boss to ask some other journalist to read it? He said, 
I'm not married. I have an EMI on my apartment. I've got elderly parents. They want me to be without a job tomorrow. If he did not go out on the winter day to Noida to read the script written by the copywriter in the studio into the camera on a wintry Saturday night or a Sunday night, he will lose his job tomorrow. Do I have to recite the names of anchors who were sacked from the media over the last four or five years who have not been able to find a job yet? These anchors were household names. Only two weeks ago, another anchor whom I sent a message about his channel, he said, sir, I have left my channel. Everybody lives in fear. This is the... We have to overcome this problem. You have to live without fear. Each one has to write a profile in courage. I have no fear. I have no fear. And I'll vote without fear or favor. Today, most people vote with fear or because of a favor. Unless enough people vote without fear and favor and stand up without fear and speak what they feel, it's not possible to arrest this slide. Go ahead. Good evening, sir. Good evening, brother. Sir, I am Sagar Datta. I am a fourth year law student, sir. Sir, so my, uh, I will request you to just say a few words or uh, a personal comment on what is the role of a student. Sir, so like me, for example, I am a 21 years old and maybe whatever is happening in the country, many things I am not agreeing upon and I don't know what to do. But I, I have the strength, I am in a riskless position and I want to do something. But I don't know what to do. So what will be anything that you can say? As a student, I think your first duty to yourself, your family, your parents is to acquire knowledge. Without knowledge you can't do anything. Those who have been able to do something is because they acquired knowledge acquired not information but knowledge and ability to reason and analyze and find solutions. You have to acquire knowledge. Without skills you can't do anything. You can't do anything. You must have a skill. Your skill will be legal skills. First you have to acquire knowledge. And in fact, that is the last thing you should be doing now. Only when you step out into the world, then you will find opportunities to do something. I think a lawyer can instill courage in his clients. You may be fighting a good cause or a bad cause, but the man who's fighting his cause must feel he's fighting with courage is cause. Today, most people can't even fight for their causes because they are poor, they don't have power, they don't have influence, they don't have access to the courts, they don't have access to tools of litigation. So you can empower your client, you empower your community, empower your neighborhood, empower your people in your village. There are so many things you can do. You will find out yourself that you can do so many things. There is no lack of things to do. Question is, are you enough knowledge and skills to do what you want to do? So my advice to you now, Giving advice is the worst thing in the world. But my advice to you is acquire knowledge 
as much knowledge as you require as your instruments and tools to voyage through this life. Thank you, sir. There was a hand here. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Father, may I? At present, uh, democracy in India has already been uh, hollowed out. And uh, I can see, and I'm sure there are no, no need to get evidences, but hardly any democracy is left at the moment in India because of so many evidences are there. Not free institutions and uh, judiciary is not there, <coughs> no free elections, so many things. No need to list out all those things. And there are a few people like you, for example, who speak about uh, those kind of things, and I listen to many of your talks in other places, first time hearing it directly. And I listen to many other elites of your kind, that same group. And uh, there is a small group like that. But uh, the majority of India is uh, complacent. Nobody sort of, uh, nothing happens actually They're against this one. And you spoke about fear and so on. It is very much widespread. And I have my own reasons why there is no reactions actually from the majority of the people. And why, what can you give some reason why you think, even though the situation is so bad, why is it that the, the majority of the population is so complacent and there's no real reactions and uh, nothing seems to be going to happen. So kind of a revolution should happen, I think. A revolution. So why is it not happening? Why, what do you think? I used to feel the same way as you feel. Why are people so complacent? Why are they not thousands and thousands of people coming out in the streets and protesting, like you see in other countries? Even in semi-dictatorships, people come out and protest. The Arab Spring, for example. But the a closer analysis tells me they are not complacent, they are helpless. They are completely helpless. They are helpless because they don't have jobs, they don't have incomes. You make this country, every young person in this country hold a job. Every young person in this country who's looking for a job, if he or she gets a job, and incomes in this country rise sharply. If India is growing at 6%, as they claim, why are incomes not growing at 6%? Incomes are not growing. Real income is negative. They claim that real growth is 6%. Nominal growth is 11-12%. Real growth is 6% or 7%. In fact, they said last quarter was 7.8%. Why are real incomes not growing by 7% or 8%? Because the bulk of the wealth is growing to one small section. This is what the finding of Thomas Piketty is. And it's absolutely true. If I think, if I, I think that if you make every young person have a job, and if incomes rise by more or less the same rate as the GDP grows, you will find a very different kind of reaction among the people. They will not be so helpless. They will become assertive. Yeah. There's someone there? No, I think. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yes. The one who raised his hand. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Go ahead, louder. Uh, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. My name is Mohit Shao. I'm currently the vice chairman of the Institute of Family Secretaries of India. Uh, first of all, thank you, sir, for the enlightening uh, deliberation. My question is, you have rightly pointed out regarding the right to live without fear in order to vote. But being a part of the youth as well as many professionals, what I have found that people are confused with the advancement of technology and advancement of media as well. 
specifically social media. As one of the youngsters over here rightly pointed out, that as a youth, what I should do. But what I have felt, that's a question over here. Do you think advancement of technology and social media, is it redefining democracy or actually killing it? Neither. You see, technology is not changing at pace only in this century. You look back every century, every century was a giant leap of technology over the previous century. Remember, it was only 200 years ago. You can't speak to anyone who's not within your sight. Until Marconi discovered that you can speak to somebody who's out of sight. That was only 200 years ago. It's, a, it's not 2,000 years ago. 200 years ago. So every century, forget century, every decade is a technological advance upon the previous decade. Every century is a leap of technology over the previous century. You just ask yourself if you can trace your lineology. Uh, what your great-great-grandfather, what kind of world he lived in. Your great-grandfather's age was a leap of technology over your great-great-grandfather. Your grandfather's age was a leap of technology. Your father's age was a leap of technology. You believe it's a leap of technology over your father. Your son will believe it's a gallop over technology over your life. So I don't think there is any change in the uh, pace of technology. In fact, the pace is faster. Uh, the car is accelerating faster. Be that as it may. It's your ability to cope with technology, to master technology, to become the, a skilled, uh, uh, acquire the skills to manage this technology. See, when people were riding horses, when the train came, it was a leap of technology. But they mastered the technology of how to run trains. So you have to master technology. Don't allow technology to become your master. You can master technology. If A can invent a new technology, B can also acquire the same technological skills. Why do you feel that if A has invented a technology, I, I'm helpless? You're not helpless. You can acquire the technology. It's only in the last Two years, the Supreme Court has gone from paper to paperless. In the Chief Justice's court today, he does not even allow lawyers to refer to hard copies of the paper book. He says, if you want to argue in my court, argue only from a digital device. In only two years. So it's not as though uh, technology should frighten us. Technology is a human invention. The human mind, I think, is the biggest inventor. If techno every technology is a human invention, and other humans can also acquire those technological skills. Uh, we shall take two more questions. No, we will uh, give it to Professor Prabhat Kumar Tato. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for your fascinating presentation. I assumed the political science, I was very patiently listening to a presentation on the future of democracy. I believe the point that you have raised uh, matter much in understanding and assessing the future of democracy. You have mentioned about the, the increasing centralization as a great threat to democracy. While fully endorsing your position, I would like to submit for your kind consideration. In 1992, we have tried to create, we have tried to make two constitutional amendments to usher in a process of decentralization. But the fact remains that the process has not worked well. Then how can you make sure that there would be a stop of centralization in our country in the day ahead? I personally feel the centralization being promoted by the fact that one party rule is gradually becoming a reality. If that goes on, unabated, then centralization will continue to be there. My second submission is that 
Uh, do we need to empower the civil society to, to create, to mount bottom-up pressure for the purpose of uh, ensuring the process of decentralization? Thank you, sir. I agree with you that a long one-party rule will give an impetus to the centralization. I'm a firm believer that no party should rule for more than two terms, either in India or in the state, even if it's my own party. One party rule beyond 10 years is, I think, detrimental to democracy. Which is the state which has the highest decentralization? And everybody knows the answer, for those who do not know. The highest decentralization is in Kerala. Yeah. The panchayats and the municipalities are in Kerala are extremely empowered. And both fronts or both parties vie with each other to say we will further empower the panchayats and the municipalities. But if he says anything different, he will be defeated. <laughs> So both vie with each other towards decentralization, which is why decentralization has worked in Kerala effectively. In many other states, the 72nd and 73rd amendments which you referred to, devolving power upon panchayats and municipalities has not worked because one of the three items has been devolved. Only Power has been devolved. Finances have not been devolved. Functionaries have not been devolved. So today, what does the Sarpanj do? What does the Panchayat Samiti Chairman do? He has got the function that I must do this, I must do that. He has no money. He has no officers to execute those programs. So he exercises those powers for all the wrong reasons, for all the wrong purposes. Because he cannot do anything. Technically, the chairman of the district panchayat was supposed to be as effective, as powerful as the collector. Today, the chairman of the district panchayat is not to be seen or heard. Therefore, the failure of the 92 reform was because of we failed to devolve finances, we failed to devolve functionaries. Another government can make another effort, like Rajiv Gandhi did, to try to devolve all three functions, functionaries and funds to the local bodies and then maybe they can be given a new lease of life. We take we take a last question. Yes. Right there someone put up his hand. Yeah, you are the one. Go ahead. Good evening, sir. Uh, it has been a wonderful uh, experience listening to you in person. Uh, so you made a very interesting point uh, about uh, reconstitution with the midterm reconstitutions in uh, Council of Ministers due to cross-party defections, right? Uh, so on this point, I also wanted to know your views on the legitimacy of uh, you know post-election coalitions. Thank you. But post-election coalitions are the rule in Europe. The, two days ago, there was an election in Netherlands. They say they will take two months or three months to form a government. It's perfectly all right. I remember Belgium. You know, Belgium is divided into two linguistic groups, um, Flemish and French. The coalition, one becomes the prime minister, one becomes the finance minister. The then finance minister, and number two in that Belgium cabinet was a good friend of mine. 
and I was visiting Bill Chin, that as his guest. And he said, uh, the last election, the Prime Minister's party won, my party also won, but we don't have the numbers to form a government. We are still looking for another party uh, to make up the majority. I said, in the meanwhile, what do you do? He said, what's the problem? Uh, we take last year's budget, divide it by two, 12, and give the money to each department. <laughs> And uh, I was meeting in his office, so he said, fine, uh, let's go for lunch. Uh, before we go for lunch, let's drop in at the Prime Minister's office. I said, fine. So we walked from his office on the road to the Prime Minister's office. Then I asked him, how long have you been doing this search for a government? He said, eight months. Eight months they were searching a partner to make a government. In the meanwhile, the interim government was continuing. There were no, no anxiety among the Belgians. There was no protest, nothing. And we were walking on the road, and uh, nobody seemed to get excited to see the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister walking on the road. It was all uh, normal. So post-election coalitions are the norm in many, many European countries. It is the norm in Germany for the last 40 years. So why are we getting alarmed about post-election coalition? According to me, a coalition government delivers better than a one-party government. I am firm view that no party should get 262. It should stop with 240 or so. Dependent upon another party which will act as a check and balance. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you for patiently listening and answering our questions. We move ahead with the book launch. I would now like to request Professor Prabhat Kumar Dutta to kindly come on stage and introduce the book Development, Decentralization and Democracy. Respected Chancellor, St. Davis University, Father James Harrison Tatum, SJ. Respected Father Vice Chancellor, Dr. John Felix Lach, SJ. Honorable Member of Parliament, Former Indian Minister of Finance, Mr. P. Chitambaram, Distinguished Members of the Intellectual Community of Kolkata, Invited Guests, Esteemed Fathers, Sisters, Colleagues of both teaching and non-teaching segment of our university, including the support staff. The idea of writing this book was conceived in an informal discussion in the office of the Father Vice Chancellor about a year ago. The key focus of the discussion was the dark of adequate, authentic and useful reading material on the conceptual and operational issues of development, decentralization, and democracy in India for the postgraduate and undergraduate students of all the major social sciences, academicians, public officials, and civil society activists. After taking into account all these considerations, we decided to write a book on the interrelated themes. And the managing director of the Heritage Bookshop, Dashgupta and Company, and the publishing editor, Anuttam Banerjee, readily agreed to publish the book. We have received help and support 
from the Faculty of Mass Communication Department of our University, Dr. Shomok Shen, from the Office of the Father Vice Chancellor, more particularly from Mr. Suripto Ghosh, at the stage of proofreading and follow up. I would like to thank you all on behalf of the Father Vice Chancellor as well as on my behalf. We are deeply grateful to you, sir, Mr. P. Chidambaramji, for having been in our midst to release the book. Significantly, the book is dedicated to the fond memories of an illustrious Jesuit father, Albert Fawat, whom I knew, who devoted his entire life to the great cause of Dalloway's education. We are happy that the book is being released in the hall named after him. Three intertwined paradigms of social sciences, namely development, decentralization, and democracy, with the texture of the standalone chapters captured in three sections of the book, consisting of about 230 pages. While the first one refers to goal, that is development of the people through their active participation, the other two are regarded as modes of achieving the goal. These concepts and the practices have metamorphosed in their content and other paintings over the last few decades. The present book seeks to capture them with a view to drawing meaningful insights and suitable conclusions for all the stakeholders. The first section begins with a chapter on redefining development, which provides fresh perspective. While social value of development constitutes the central thrust of the second chapter, the third chapter attempts a critical appraisal of the economic reforms in our country. As growing corruption is regarded as a threat to development, we have included a chapter on ethical governance as an alternative model. Issues of rural development with special focus on how politicization matters and where it leads to has been the core of the last chapter in this section. The twin constitutional amendments made in 1992 have refueled the engine of democratic decentralization, but the experiences of the journey over the last three decades indicate that the road is still bumpy and full of potholes. Thus the huge big car seems to be running slowly and sometimes halts at crossroads and there, there are views that the drivers themselves are sometimes hesitant and often reluctant. Uh, as a result of that, this kind of situation is demanding. We have tried to look back to make an analytical review of the past and beyond to suggest corrective measures. The second section, consisting of five chapters, begins with an analysis of the role of the civil society in the neoliberal context of governance in our country. It is followed up by an empirical chapter on the dynamics of state civil society relationship in the delivery of public services during the turbulent times of the COVID pandemic, drawing lessons from Kerala. An attempt has been made in the following chapter to capture the perceptions and experiences of the women elected leaders, focusing on the challenges they experience and their effects on women empowerment in general. The last chapter presents a critical review of the innovative experiment of decentralized governance in one of the hill states in West Bengal, that is uh, in Darjeeling. Participation of the stakeholders is now widely regarded as a sine qua non for inclusive development and responsive governance. New public governance theory speaks about increasing citizens' participation and expanding the role of the bureaucracy in the work of government. The third section of the book seeks to explore the dynamics of participatory democracy in rural and urban India and highlights where the soup inches and what needs to be done to make deliberative democracy a more meaningful exercise in our country. Before I conclude, I would like to extend my, our sincere thanks to the galaxy of respected <coughs> academicians, including officers of the university, our esteemed fathers, sisters, colleagues,
staff members, media persons who have access, <coughs> your gracious presence is a great source of our encouragement. Thank you again. Thank you for giving me patient hearing. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, sir, for providing us an overview of yoga. It is my pleasure to invite the Honorable Vice Chancellor of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata, Reverend Father Dr. John Felix Raj, and our special guest, Mr. Chidambaram, to unveil and release the book. Mr. Anuttam Banerjee, Publishing Editor, Das Gupta and Company, to felicitate our special guest, Mr. Chidambaram, Reverend Father Dr. John Felix Raj, and Professor Prabhat Kumar Dutta. Professor Ashish 
have raised our Mr. P. Chidambaran, Honorable Chancellor of this University, Reverend Dr. James Argentete, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Reverend Dr. John Felix Raj, distinguished guests, <coughs> faculty members, officers, other staff members, members of the Alumni Association, and my dear students. Today, on behalf of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata, it is my privilege to mention that we are immensely thankful, sir, to you, our special guest, Mr. Fiji Dhammaran, for your gracious presence here, for this book launch program. The speech delivered by you is quite thought-provoking with the elegance of explaining the key terms. But I have understood today the meaning of democracy, if I can quote our Gurudev Ravindranath Tagore, is democracy is where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. <clears throat> Sir, I would like to express our sincere gratitude for taking time out of your busy schedule and come from Delhi to Kolkata for this exclusive event. Sir has not kept any other program, has not accepted any other program and I understand that he has not shared this information with anyone so that he is not invited to any other place. <laughs> I will fail in my duty if I do not mention one person who has created this opportunity for all of us to be present and all of us to experience this memorable occasion. <clears throat> Without his initiative and his active leadership, this would not have been possible. Words of thanks will be inadequate to express our appreciation. He is our Honorable Vice Chancellor, our beloved leader, and also an accomplished author, Reverend Dr. John Felix Raj. And for this particular book launch program, it is also my opportunity to thank Professor Kovat Dr the co-author of this book and because primarily for this occasion we are present here. I also like to express my heartfelt thanks on behalf of St. Xavier's University Kolkata, the presence of our Chancellor here who has been here for a few days and today I know he had a very long day starting from the governing board meeting and he has stayed back for this program. Thank you Father for your presence. <laughs> this is my not only duty, my heartfelt appreciation to those special invitees who are there today to witness this program and also to listen to this thought-provoking address delivered by our special guest. I also take this opportunity to thank the members of the faculty, other staff members for making this program possible and also I will fail in my duty if I don't mention, I know there are many, but I must mention few names like our communication and protocol officer Mr. Mario Martin Lewis, our professor here Dr. Monalika De. We have Mr. Sundeep Kundra, a sports officer, Mr. Jarman Mundi for giving all IT support. We can also see it later in different channels, I think. And Mr. Benedict for the photography, members of the press, and last but not the least, our students who have made this program really meaningful. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I request the audience to kindly rise as the dignitaries leave the auditorium.
Jaman 